We are in the American Museum of Natural History's uh, Hayden Planetarium. The Zeiss projector is behind me. Uh, and this evening, I am delighted to be interviewing Dr. Wendy Friedman, who is director of the Carnegie Observatories in Pasadena, California. Wendy, welcome, and thanks for doing the interview. Oh, thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you, before I asked you about Hubble and telescopes and astronomy and all those great things, how did you come to this? What made you decide uh, to become an astronomer? I think if I look back on my life, it makes more sense uh, now. I never knew, I wasn't one of these people who grew up grinding my own mirrors and knowing that I wanted to be an astronomer. But there are periods in my life that I can look back to and say, ah, that was a moment where I got hooked. Mm -hmm. And the first one, I was about seven years old, and I was in northern Ontario, grew up in Canada, mm -hmm. and my father was showing the night sky to me, a dark sky, never seen a dark sky quite as dark. And he was explaining about light travel time and how the objects that we were looking at in the sky might not be there anymore because of the finite speed of light takes a long time to travel an astronomical distance and the object might not be there anymore. We're seeing it as it was when the light left it. And I, I remember that sense of awe and and I was always interested in astronomy. I loved math and physics, but it never occurred to me that you could be a professional astronomer. I didn't know anyone who did that. I went to the library, devoured every book on the bookshelf having to do with astronomy, mm -hmm. but I thought I would major in, in biophysics when I entered university because I love physics, I love biology, but I took an astronomy course and, uh, and I never looked back after that. When you today look at where you work, which is very intimately connected with Hubble, not the Hubble Space Telescope, but Edwin Hubble, the astronomer, you must see it all come full circle. Can you tell us a little bit about Edwin Hubble and your connection to him? Edwin Hubble, after whom the Space Telescope was named, was an astronomer at the Carnegie Institution, then known as the Mount Wilson Observatories. And an astronomer by the name of George Ellery Hale had become interested in building large reflecting telescopes around the turn of the last century. And he convinced Andrew Carnegie that the way to make progress in astronomy was to build new large telescopes with big reflecting mirrors. And this is the Carnegie of Carnegie Steel. This is the Carnegie of Carnegie Steel. So the process of going to ask very wealthy donors to help support our science has not been invented in the 21st century just recently. No, it's very interesting, but astronomy does appeal to the private sector. There are a lot of people who resonate with the qu same questions that astronomers asked mm -hmm. and continue to ask, what is the origin of the universe? Are we alone in the universe? Mm -hmm. The mysteries of the universe, I think, resonate with all of us. Mm -hmm perhaps as children more, we ask those questions, but some of us grow up as professional astronomers and we never stop asking those questions. Right. And, and there are individuals who have enabled that mm -hmm. for astronomy by building these large telescopes, which have led to revolutionary discoveries. So Carnegie was convinced to give a significant amount of money to astronomy. What happened? So Carnegie gave a gift initially of $10 million to enable science. And his idea, his vision was that if you hired the best and the brightest, as he put it, men in those days, and you gave them resources, mm -hmm. that discoveries would follow. And George Ellery Hale began, he came out to Pasadena in 1903, did some surveying of the mountains to the north of California, and discovered that they were a tremendous site for astronomical telescopes. Dark at that time, reasonably dry and high and stable, and built first a solar telescope. George Ellery Hale was a solar astronomer himself, and then a 60-inch telescope, reflecting telescope. And that was a telescope that allowed Harlow Shapley to show that the, the sun was not the center of the universe. So that was the picture we were left with after Copernicus, 1543, who came forward with a model that had the sun at the center of the universe. 
and for about 400 years we believed that the, the, the solar system was at the center of the universe. And not the Earth anymore, which Copernicus displaced the Aristotelian view of the universe. And what Shapley showed was that the Sun is actually about two-thirds of the way out in a disk of what turns out to be our own Milky Way galaxy, not the center. And that was the first major discovery to come out of the 60-inch telescope. That must have been quite a shock, even to the astronomers at the huge, time. Huge shock. And, and it's it, fascinating to those of us who are thinking about building big telescopes now. Here's this amazing discovery. And before the telescope was even completed, in fact, George Ellery Hale was on to building a 100-inch telescope, where Edwin Hubble made his discoveries. So now we have sun displaced from the center of the universe at that time. We didn't know of the existence of, of other galaxies outside the Milky Way. In fact, there was a big debate at the time about whether the Milky Way was the entire extent of the universe or whether there might be island universes outside of our own Milky Way. And there were these regions that people had seen on photographic plates, spiral in shape, and it was plausible that they were regions where gas was spinning and maybe collecting to form new stars in the Milky Way. And Edwin Hubble came along and, and he took some of these photographic plates at the 100-inch telescope, just been completed, and what he found was that there were small pinpoints of light on these plates that changed in brightness over time. Now, if you, if you look at the sky on a human life t scale, time scale, those objects don't appear to vary. Most objects are pretty boring. They're the same brightness, you come back, they look the same. And what Hubble found was that some of the objects were actually varying on time scales of maybe days or, or months, changing in their brightness. And the properties of those objects resembled a kind of star that had been first discovered in the 1700s called a Cepheid variable. And we learned eventually that those were stars whose outer atmospheres were pulsating, actually moving in and out. And as they move in and out, the brightness of the star varies. And it had been shown that the rate at which the star actually varies, moving in and out, changing in brightness, correlates directly with how bright the star is. So brighter the star, the slower the atmosphere is moving. And so you have a 100 watt standard light bulb. A standard light bulb. And if you think of it, if you look at the sky, you don't know if an object is bright because it's nearby, or maybe it's, um, uh, when you look at a faint object, is it faint because it's far away, or is it intrinsically fainter because of the property of the object? And this Cepheid period luminosity relation, discovered by an astronomer named Henrietta Leavitt, provided a, a unique way of measuring distance. And Hubble used that to show that these objects he was looking at, these fuzzy spiral nebulae, weren't part of the Milky Way, but they were actually galaxies in their own right, similar to the Milky Way, but at very great distances. Did everyone believe him right away? It was pretty well accepted pretty quickly because the Cepheid period re luminosity relation had been well established. There had been this giant debate, but measuring the distances directly was the key. You could now show these were objects well outside the confines of, of the Milky Way. So phenomenal discovery. Mm -hmm. The universe has just increased in size. And if that had been the only discovery that Edwin Hubble had ever made, it would have been a spectacular discovery. But what he also noticed was that if you looked at how fast a galaxy was moving, and there had been measurements of velocities of these spiral nebulae that had been made by an astronomer by the name of Vesto Slipher, and when he looked at and compared the velocity of a galaxy to hit its distance, the farther a galaxy was away from us, the faster it appeared to be moving away from us. So, Distant galaxies moving quickly, nearby galaxies also moving away from us, except for the very, very nearest ones, like the Andromeda galaxies actually moving toward us because of the gravitational force um, with our own Milky Way. Uh, but every galaxy he looked at pretty much was moving away. And what that meant was if you think about 
if a galaxy is moving, it's far away, there must have been a time earlier in the past when the galaxy was closer to us. Extrapolate back and back. There was a beginning to this. And Albert Einstein, 1915, had come up with his general theory of relativity, a theory that described gravity and space and time. And, and Einstein had thought and talked to astronomers of the day that the universe was static. There was no evidence for any motion. Stars were not moving. And, and Einstein had thought that he needed to introduce a term into the general theory of relativity to force the universe to be static. Gravity is an attractive force. Matter in the universe would tend to draw things together or the universe could be expanding. So he added a term called the cosmological constant, a mathematical term to force the universe to be static. Then when Edwin Hubble discovered the expansion, he was later reputed to have said this was his biggest blunder because he missed the opportunity to predict the expansion. He, he knew what the equations were telling him, but the data one there. Well, he could have either predicted the expansion or the contraction. Yes. He had no way of knowing which yeah, one, right. but, but the universe was in motion. Mm -hmm. But the story doesn't end there, of course. It gets both more complicated and simpler and more interesting. What happens next? So there, there is a period where, so Hubble has shown the universe is expanding. Mm -hmm. We went through several decades where we didn't understand what the, the size and the age of the universe or its rate of expansion was to better than a factor of two. And, and I'll, I'll maybe come back to that in a minute because that, that's something I've been very much involved with. But in terms of this question of whether there's a cosmological constant, there's a very interesting new chapter to that story. And that is that astronomers in, in just over a decade ago discovered that not only is the universe expanding, but it's speeding up in its expansion. It's accelerating. And one way of explaining that acceleration is precisely the term that Einstein removed from his equation. And he may have been right after all. So if you're Einstein, maybe your worst mistake <laughs> turns out to be a fundamental discovery. What a remarkable set of coincidences and outcomes. Now, the Cepheids themselves have been something that you have looked at very long and very hard. Why and how did you also use Hubble, not the astronomer, now the telescope, uh, to work on Cepheids? So the, the Cepheid variables have turned out to be the most accurate means that astronomers have for measuring distances to objects outside of the Milky Way galaxy. And the difficulty turned out to be, so Hubble measured the expansion showed first that there were <laughs> galaxies in their own right and the universe is expanding. But it turned out to be very difficult to measure that expansion rate accurately for a number of reasons. One is the Cepheid stars themselves are fairly young and they're located in regions where there's gas and dust out of which the stars formed. And the dust has the property that if light coming from the Cepheid hits a dust grain on the way to us and our telescopes, it will scatter the light, scatter the photon, or absorb it. And so it has a consequence that it always makes the star look fainter. You're always taking light away. You never make it look brighter. It's a systematic effect. So no matter how many times you make a measurement of the star, you're going to get it wrong if you don't allow for the presence of the dust. It makes it look fainter, therefore it makes it look farther away. And people struggled with this for decades. We didn't know the size or the age of the universe to better than a factor of two. And it became possible in the 1980s with the new digital technology, the same technology we now use in our handheld cameras, to make measurements not only at blue wavelengths, which is what Hubble had done, but also in the red part of the spectrum. And essentially the dust doesn't see in the red part of the spectrum, the wavelength of light is long enough that it doesn't pay any attention to these tiny dust grains, which are actually the, the size of the wavelength of blue light. And so this terrible, annoying effect of making the stars fainter is going to be much less. Much less, and you can correct for it. 
And so that's something that I became involved in doing, is making measurements with these new digital detectors and discovered that the distance that you measured to a galaxy depended on what wavelength you made the measurement. Clearly can't be right. And, and so uh, the, the, in the blue part of the spectrum, the galaxy was further away. It had the effect of changing the distances by about a factor of two, which is clearly if you're trying to measure an accurate distance, not something you want to have happen. Now, can you believe the red distances? Is there something else that can be messing you up there, yeah. giving you some other systematic effect? And, and that's something that I worried about a lot early on. And, and another possibility is that the chemical composition of the star itself if there are metals in the atmosphere of the star, they could also be absorbing light. And you want to make sure that you're not having an effect because of the chemical composition of the star. And so that was early work I was in, involved in to try and, and put together an empirical test to see how much you might be affected by that. And what we found was that essentially the redder you made the observations, the less of an effect that you had. And we could test that by using a number of different methods for using distance. And, and around the same time, the Hubble Space Telescope was about to be launched. And Hubble, in fact, was built. One of the primary motivations for building Hubble was to resolve this debate over the size and the age of the universe that we didn't know it to better than a factor of two. And in fact, the size of the primary mirror of Hubble was set by the ability to find these Cepheid variables in a nearby cluster we call the Virgo cluster, which we now know to be about 50 million light years away from us. And so the mirror might have been smaller had not there been this reason to say, no, we don't want it any smaller, otherwise we won't be able to resolve this question of the age and the size of the universe. So even before Hubble was launched, this was considered one of the primary goals of the Hubble telescope. If you didn't accomplish this, then Hubble would fail in one of its main goals. That's right. And in fact, the director of the Space Telescope Institute at the time, Ricardo Giacconi, put together a panel and asked the question, if Hubble were to fall in the ocean early on, what would you not be able to solve from the ground? And, and in particular, if you make this superb instrument available to astronomers, they're likely to divide up the time into tiny, tiny little pieces so everybody could have a piece. But there might be some problems that would require a lot of time. So he asked the community to come up with what he called key projects. And the Hubble uh, constant, this expansion rate of the universe, was named as one of the, the key projects for Hubble. But even earlier than that, the size of the mirror was, was set by the ability to find Cepheids in the Virgo cluster. Now you led the team that actually looked at all of this Hubble data. Obviously you couldn't do this yourself, an enormous amount of work and many people involved. Uh, but in the end, um, you were the head of the team and you did come up with a result that seems really to have withstood the test of time. What is the bottom line? What's the number and what does it mean? The number that we measured is 72. The debate at the time was is the Hubble constant 50 or 100? The units are kilometers per second per million parsecs. That's a mouthful. It's, a, it's the rate of expansion at the current time. And what we found was measuring the Hubble constant in a variety of ways. We used five different techniques. And we said, we will resolve this factor of two. And we did that. We measured the Hubble constant for the first time to an accuracy of 10%. And, and, and the, at every step, we use different methods to say, OK, what is the uncertainty at every step of this measurement or calculation? And, and you're right, it stood the test of time. There was another NASA mission shortly after our final results were published that came up with um, 73, I believe, kilometers per second per megaparsec. And, and there have been groups in the intervening time. We published our results in 2001. And our own group now has measured a Hubble constant to 5 or 6%. And there are other groups also doing that. And, and we now have a program to try and measure the Hubble constant to 2%. We think that's now feasible. Now, the Hubble constant itself and the rate of expansion of the universe is a very interesting thing. But it's intimately connected with the age of the universe, which perhaps speaks more to us deep in our gut. What's the connection and what's the age? The connection is if you now observe the universe to be expanding, then you can ask, well, how long it, has it been expanding for? And the age depends on the Hubble constant. That's the primary 
uh, factor in the determination of the age, but it also depends on the amount of matter in the universe, and it depends on whether there is this term, this cosmological constant or dark energy, which Einstein had hinted at in his equations he tried to get rid of. And so based again on general relativity, you can use those equations, or if you think of it simply as running a movie in reverse, you calculate how long it's been expanding for. And the answer that we get is 13.7 billion years. So that 13.7 thousand million years. And there are other independent methods for determining that age now. Uh, and they agree remarkably well. They agree remarkably well. We can measure the ages of the oldest stars in our Milky Way galaxy, measurements of, of the temperature, differences in temperature from the microwave background radiation allow us to get another handle on the age. And they're all, all in remarkable agreement. Now, if you've measured it to 10% or 5% and you can get it down to 2%, what do you gain? At some point, you'll re reach such precision that the funding committees will surely come back and say, well, really, who cares about the sixth decimal place? Right. No, the really interesting thing is that a uh, precise value of the Hubble constant lets you get much more precise constraints on the amount of dark energy in the universe. So all these things are coupled, and that's right now the interest for me. I, I don't care anymore. We, we so settled this debate of a factor of two, and we could keep increasing the precision and getting more decimal places. But the fact that we can now learn about dark energy in the universe, and it's one of the mo most precise measurements we can make on the amount of dark energy, mm -hmm. makes continuing to increase the accuracy of the Hubble constant even more exciting. Now, you've referred both to the dark matter and to the dark energy. Tell us, please, what they are and what they're made of. The dark matter is, we first had a hint of the existence of dark matter. That is matter unlike what we are made of. The ordinary protons and neutrons and things that make up carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, everything that is life based on Earth and that we're familiar with. And there was an astronomer by the name of Fritz Wicke, who in the 1930s had been looking at the motions of galaxies now in clusters of galaxies. And what he noticed was that the velocities were so high that if you looked at the mass of the cluster based on the light fr coming from those galaxies, the galaxies should have flown off long ago. They wouldn't be bound to the cluster unless there was matter there that was acting gravitationally and, and causing them to be bound to the cluster. Something was missing that we could see. So people didn't pay much attention to this result for a long time because they thought, well, maybe there's something wrong in the way we estimate the masses or measure the velocities. And it was a curiosity, but it was kind of swept under the rug. Now, Zwicky himself was a bit of a character, wasn't he? And that surely could not have helped in propagating his idea forward. Zwicky was a brilliant eccentric. He had no patience for the fools that he thought were his colleagues. <laughs> and he probably didn't help his case, you're correct. And, and so it was decades before an astronomer by the name of Vera Rubin came along. And she started to measure the velocities of stars now in the outer parts of spiral galaxies. So rather than galaxies within clusters, she's looking at stars within galaxies. And the expectation was that the velocity of stars in the outer parts of the galaxy would fall off relative to the, the stars in the in, inner parts of galaxies. And it would be very much like the motions of planets in our own solar system, very well established uh, and known as Keplerian motion after Johann Kepler. Surprise was the velocities didn't fall off. They stayed constant or flat. And it's the same problem. What was holding those stars bound to the galaxy? They ought to be flying off if they're moving that fast. And it was indicating that there was more matter there than we could see. Okay, so it's another curiosity. Maybe there's something we don't understand. Maybe even the laws of gravity don't hold in the outer parts of galaxies, a possibility. But what's happened over the last several decades is a number of independent ways of getting at the masses of stars and galaxies and galaxies and clusters. For example, measuring hot X-ray gas in clusters. When it became possible to have satellites that could measure X-rays get above the Earth's atmosphere, the temperatures that you measured for gas in these clusters were exceedingly high. 
again, this gas ought to have evaporated long ago, couldn't have remained bound to the cluster unless there was more mass there. Einstein predicted in his theory of general relativity that if you had a massive object and you had light coming from a distant source, it would actually bend, light would bend because of the curvature of, of space-time as it came by a massive object. So people began to make measurements of this actual bending of light became feasible, again, indicating more mass. So very hard to suddenly just push all of this away and say there's nothing there. All of these completely independent lines of evidence are pointing to more matter than we can see, which is what astronomers now refer to as dark matter. Interacts gravitationally, so people wondered, okay, what is the dark matter? And the number of candidates. Maybe there are rocks out in interstellar medium, planets. Maybe they're failed stars. We don't see them shine in light, but they're, again, the influence of gravity is there. Maybe they're, um, maybe it's gas, cold gas, or very hot gas. People looked at all these possibilities, objects in the halo of our galaxy, and none of them panned out. They spent decades looking for them. Black holes, maybe there's a population of black holes. Well, we ought to see them in x-rays. Nothing could explain the dark matter. So the best evidence, so you're asking, what is it? <laughs> the short answer is we don't yet know. And the best possibility at the moment appears to be a particle that was likely formed after the Big Bang, shortly after the Big Bang, that interacts weakly via gravity, but does not emit any light, no electromagnetic radiation. Spooky. <laughs> Spooky or very interesting. And it comes out of, naturally, out of many theories in elementary particle physics that are beyond what particle physics referred to as the standard model. So they, they arise naturally, they're predicted out of those models. And, and what's exciting is in the next decade or so, there'll be several opportunities to test those theories in large accelerators in Geneva, CERN, between the, the Swiss and the French border, there's a large accelerator. If, if the dark matter is made of this stuff, there should be evidence in the showers that are created when you're having protons collide at very high energy. And there are also experiments around the world now that are down in underground laboratories with detectors made of silicon and germanium, and they're looking for the tiny signature of when this p hypothetical particle of dark matter would come and interact and, and create sound waves effectively as they interact with the nuclei of the atoms in the detector. And of course, when that thing is discovered, astronomers will point out and say, you see, I told you so. You bet. Well, th what's interesting is these, these discoveries have come out of astronomy. They weren't predicted. That's right. But the evidence has come out of astronomical observations. Very interesting. Now, the dark energy. The dark energy is very different. So dark matter is, is, uh, interacts via gravity. Gravity is an attractive force. The dark energy is repulsive in nature. It appears to be a tension in the universe that's causing the universe to speed up in its expansion. And so it's acting counter to gravity, effectively. And, and the, the matter in the universe uh, appears to be about 25% of the overall matter plus energy. The dark energy is about 70% of the composition of the universe. Extraordinary, it's the dominant component that leaves almost nothing for us. Almost nothing. 4% is us, the ordinary protons, neutrons, and, and matter as we know it. What we're made of, what planets are made of, what stars are made of. We're, we're really the tip of the iceberg. It's, it's phenomenal. Last question, because we do have to finish up, and that is audaciousness in large telescopes. Astronomers are always trying to build bigger telescopes. They want more light because these things are so faint. You and your colleagues have undertaken what is probably the most audacious telescope project in history. Uh, not probably, it is. Uh, you're trying to build a 25-meter telescope when today the world's largest telescope is about 10 meters. It's not just two and a half times bigger. In many ways, it's two and a half squared or six and something times bigger. It's going to collect vastly more light and be the most powerful astronomical telescope in the world. Uh, very expensive project, enormously difficult project. Give us a brief summary of where you are with it, and uh, does it ever keep you up at night? <laughs> the giant Magellan Telescope 
It's a 25 meter telescope that's over 80 feet in diameter. Optical telescope comprised of seven mirrors, each one of which is over eight meters in diameter. So seven mirrors, six in a circle, one in the center. And it is ambitious. If it wasn't ambitious, it would have been done before. It will have 10 times the resolution of the Hubble Space Telescope. Before Hubble, that was the yardstick of resolution. So you're right, telescopes we build bigger because we need to collect more light. That's the only thing we have to measure faint objects. And the bigger the diameter of the mirror, the better resolution, the better clarity you get on objects that you observe. So we have a, an international partnership. We have uh, colleagues in Australia and Korea, and domestically, a total of 10 partners building this telescope. It's a huge challenge. We have almost completed the first mirror. We're buying, we've bought the glass for the second mirror, and we're about a third of the way raising the funding that we need to, to build this telescope. When do you think you might see first light? Plan is 2019. So there's no instant gratification in astronomy. You do have to work long and hard at it. No instant gratification, but the really interesting problems, I think, uh, and questions are addressed when we do something that is new and different. And every big telescope that we've built historically over time, starting from Galileo and his telescope 400 years ago, every time we get new capability, we make new discoveries, and we know that. And that's what makes us excited about trying to do this. So is it challenging? Yes. Would I have it any other way? No. Thanks very much for doing the interview. Much appreciated.